ready. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us for the very first ever Boston Fit Learns. We are incredibly excited to have you all here and to have all of our amazing talks about games, game development, game development education. And we're incredibly excited about all the speakers and especially for our fantastic keynote speaker, uh, professor of game design at Northeastern University, founder of IndieCade, and overall this amazing woman in games, Celia Pierce. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm super glad to be here, and um, I love this space, it's really nice. You, yay, another new thing started in Boston by the Boston Fig people, so super excited to be here. Um, so my talk today is entitled Strange Bedfellows, Academia and the Indie Game Ecosystem. And uh, I'm gonna start with a pop quiz, since this is an educator's summit, a little test might be in order here. Okay, what do these things have in common? I think there's one more. I might give it away with the, yeah. Anybody? I was going to say they all have four ideas of the last one. No, I'm, I'm thinking about something that's not obvious from the image. So one, two. Huh? All of these games that I just showed you are published on consoles and were master's thesis projects. Most people don't know this because Sony doesn't really want you to know it. Um, and most of the developers don't really want to tell you that because they don't want to give credit to their institutions. There are literally dozens of master's thesis projects on the PlayStation at this moment. Um, so that's kind of the first thing I wanted to, to mention because it's, it's, a, it's a fact that few people are aware of. So next question, what about these things? What do these have in common? Oh. Anybody? Did you see it? No. Okay. Anybody? So we're looking at Ibn Ab, Super Hypercube, Sony VR, anybody? And The Night Journey, which was just published on PlayStation. These games all have academic faculty as co-designers or lead designers. So those are three games where somebody like me, a college professor, is credited as one of the designers. And what about these? Those were all funded by university incubators. So these are things that you're not hearing about in the press because nobody's talking about them. Um, and I started uh, doing this because I was trying to look at, um, as I'm, I'm currently working on a book about IndieCade, and I was trying to look at the larger indie ecosystem and obviously, I'm both an indie person and an academic. Um, and I wanted to understand the synergies and the larger patterns of the indie ecosystem as I was writing this book, because I didn't just want it to be about IndieCade. I wanted it to be about the, the indie explosion, really, which is what has happened in the last decade. So this is me, Stephanie Barish, and Sam Roberts, the co-founders of IndieCade. Uh, behind us is Jonathan Blow, who is showing Braid which you can see on the monitor there. John Bernheim, who's standing behind Sam, um, is, is a developer. I think he's working for Telltale now. He worked for um, on Uncharted before that, and he was one of my students at Georgia Tech. Um, so as I mentioned, IndieCade, uh, I'm working on this book, IndieCade at 10, being published by the ETC Press uh, out of Carnegie Mellon. And yeah, so I started doing this research because I didn't want to just, I wanted to see how does IndieCade fit into this larger pattern. And so in the course of doing that, I identified these factors. Uh, this is kind of a long list, but I'm just going to go through it and then show you my little visual diagram. So you won't be t quizzed on this at the end of the talk, so don't worry about that. So as I was kind of trying to tease out all the factors, these are the ones that I sort of began to see. Game academia, obviously. The idea of games as art. This is a fairly new concept. Um, I know some of, you, uh, some of you who are my students are very familiar with this, and it's pretty much a foregone conclusion in your generation. But a decade ago, it was still contested. Um, public perception and policy, also related. Uh, in 2013, the National Endowment for the Arts publicly added games to its funding categories. And the Supreme Court 
decided that games were a form of expression. So these are two examples of kind of milestones in public policy that have really changed the perception of games. Creation tools, Unity. Uh, when Unity first came out, you could only publish on one platform. <laughs> then it did, it became compatible. I think it actually started on Mac and then went to PC. Um, now you can literally publish out of Unity on almost any platform you can think of. Um, so creation tools have been a big factor. There are also a lot of other things like um, Game Maker, Twine, that have made game creation more accessible to people that are more creatively than technically inclined. Platforms, we have a lot of new platforms coming in. Um, I'm kind of amazed at the explosion of new platforms and what, one of the things I've noticed is that indie developers are always the first out of the gate doing interesting things with them. Uh, creative communities, best example of this is the Global Game Jam. There also are uh, groups like Boston Indies, which is uh, Boston Indie Collective, which is a group here in Boston that has a co-located workspace and often will hire each other on projects. Um, this is a big factor. Um, and then what I'm calling Indienomics, which is new funding and publishing platforms, and I put creative communities on there twice, sorry about that, new publishing and funding platforms. So I'm talking about things like Kickstarter, Patreon, and also itch.io, to some extent Steam, although Steam is kind of going out of style with indies at this point for a variety of reasons. And then of course festivals and exhibitions. So Boston Fig is one of the most influential actually in this, in this area. Um, and that's important because that's how people see stuff. So, you know, you always hear when you talk to business people, they go, oh, discovery is such a problem. But that's our job. Festivals are there for discovery. We enable people to go somewhere and see stuff that's been vetted so they don't have to go through 8 million things on the App Store. Um, and you'll see there's a lot, of, a lot of circulation that goes on between all these different components. But I think the festivals have really been the... Uh, amplifier, I guess, of the indie scene. Um, going back to ID, uh, IGF at GDC, Boston Fig was one of the earliest ones as well. Um, and also exhibitions like um, Jouer le Jou in Paris, which was a, a museum exhibit. Um, there's been a lot of recent museum exhibits that include video games. Museums kind of add a certain amount of cultural cachet to our field. So I just stole these little icons off the web that sort of express all the different things I was just talking about. And what I'm really finding as I'm digging down deep into this is these things all are connected. So this is just one example, but this is basically me, sort of. Um, so I worked on some of the earliest amicus briefs to get speech, free speech rights for video games. <laughs> um, I also obviously co-founded Indiecade. The tools thing is kind of random, but um, you'll see Tools come up a lot in academia. I'll give you, actually, this does pertain to me. Uh, when the Oculus Rift DK1 came out, uh, they sent free ones to every academic they knew. So they were just lying around in people's labs. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about that later. But there is definitely a relationship as new platforms come out. The smart ones will go to <coughs> academia first so that we will train our students to use their technology. Um, then you also have, there's a new platform, the Oculus thing there, and also um, the, uh, what is the pencils? I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> as you can see, this can get very complicated. So I'm going to go through a few, a couple of case studies that I think I've been using a lot to exemplify all of these synergies and interrelationships. And these are very specific, I very specifically picked them because they integrate a lot of these relationships. But there are many more that I could do. And the first one I'm going to talk about is That Game Company. How many people know who That Game Company is? OK, how many people are familiar with Journey? All right, so basically, you know who That Game Company is. They created Journey. Journey, when it came out, was the top-selling PSN game ever. Now, personally, I find that kind of shocking. Because if you had gone to Sony 10 years ago and said, we want to make an online game where people in robes are climbing up a hill, <laughs> they would have been like, you're insane. So now we have demonstrated that this can be a profitable and popular endeavor. But let me tell you a little bit about their background, because this part of the story is not known that well. Has anyone ever heard of this game, Cloud? OK, not that many people. 
Cloud is the first game that was made by the team that created Journey. They were uh, students at USC. Uh, actually, one of them was my student in his first semester when I worked there. This game was funded by USC, by one of the faculty members there, Tracy Fullerton. She had a fund from EA for her game innovation lab, and she gave these students the seed funding to make this game. This game became unbelievably popular. It was free. It broke the USC servers that it was on. Uh, it was a huge hit at all of the festivals. And through the intervention of also Tracy Fullerton, they were introduced to Sony and made a three-game <coughs> deal with PlayStation. This has done a couple of interesting things from, from my perspective as a faculty member in particular. It created a new aspiration. Um, it made it possible to make a living making artistically driven independent games. For me, this is like really important because it, it showed us this is possible. This thing we always thought was impossible is actually possible. Another thing I want to just say as a sideline, <clears throat> and this has a lot to do with my work in diversity and inclusion, it's also created an aspiration for Chinese immigrants and students in China. I've had dozens of Chinese students that I worked with over the last few years who see Genova Chen as a role model. So we don't think about these things, but actually he's had a huge amount of impact in that particular demographic. Um, this is the first game they published on PlayStation Flow. This was also a master's thesis project. Flow began as Genova's master's thesis project. I think he programmed it originally in Flash. If you're interested, there's a thesis that goes with it that you can actually read about the, the psychological research that he used as the basis for his game design. So again, have you, has anybody ever heard about this when you've read articles about Genova Chen? A few people, four people are nodding their head. You can read the thesis that this was based on. It wasn't an arbitrary creative urge. It was he had a particular thing he wanted to do with a game, and he designed a game around that idea. And the reason I bring this up, too, is that this is the kind of process that people are learning when they go to college to study games, a process that they wouldn't be doing if they weren't going to college to study games. And so it's kind of the secret underneath the, the creativity is that there's a certain kind of um, certain level of knowledge coming from this. And the other thing I wanted to say about these guys is that this team in particular is that um, they are sort of now known for making Zen games. But the thing is, they weren't always doing that. Um, when they were first students at USC, not all of them were inclined to make these kind of transcendent types of games. They learned that from being in college and studying with a person who is a master of this genre of game. Hi there. Speaking of college, a future uh, game design student, perhaps. Flower. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me about Flower, and it's, it's something that uh, also, people are not really aware of, but it relates to technology. Um, so I, <laughs> this is a little distracting. So um, I don't know if people are aware of this, but Pixar, whenever they make a movie, they always have some kind of underlying technical problem that they are trying to solve. Pixar was started, again, by computer scientists from academia. So they're like, I know, let's try to make underwater things, or let's try to make hair look realistic. So for each of their films, they have some kind of problem like that, a very academic, computer science-y kind of thing that they're trying to do. Well, it turns out, so does that game company. Um, they're working with very high-end graphics cards. And so Flower, in particular, they were working with translucence. So they were working with translucence, and they were also working with wind. So the, how many people have played flower? Yeah, so if you haven't played flower, you basically play a flock of flower petals flying around in the wind. And the control scheme is just a rocking of the uh, console controller. Also very innovative, they did the same thing with flow. They said, hey, there's an accelerometer in here. Who needs all these buttons? And so a lot of their games just use the 
one part of the controller that usually is ignored by almost all mainstream games. This is another classic example of how uh, indie developers think about technology. So they were innovating with the interface and they were innovating with the hardware. And then of course Journey, here we have wind, we have also um, sand uh, t dynamics and also a little bit of gravity. But the wind, how many people have played Journey? So if you play Journey, you know the wind is actually really important. <laughs> it's like probably the thing you deal with the most in terms of the game mechanic. Like again, and if I told you, hey, the top selling PSN game is gonna be all about walking into wind, people would have been like, you're insane. But there it is. So, um, and they're actually working on a new game now, and I can't say for sure if it's inspired by the first game they made in the USC lab, because I'm not allowed to, but <laughs> some people have hypothesized that it might be. Um, so this is a case where everything, actually the tech, the tech thing I didn't even check off. So this is a case where several different things have been touched on uh, in, this, in this indie ecosystem. And um, so the next case study is going to be this group. Um, I was doing some, some basically data analysis of this massive spreadsheet I have of the 2,000 games that we've shown in Indicate in the last 10 years. And um, I was uh, doing a, I was marking it up for uh, what I call recidivism. So people that have been in a lot of different Indicate things. And by far, without any exception, these people were the top winners of that, of that uh, census. The second top winners were Tale of Tales. I'm not gonna talk about them today because they're European and they have funding. So <laughs> anyway, um, so I don't know if people are familiar with this uh, constellation of, of organizations. So Copenhagen Game Collective, Deguta Fabric, and Nap Nap Games. They're all basically reconfigurations of the same basic group of people. So this is a game called Rukblende. This was also a, a master's thesis project. Uh, it actually might have been an undergraduate thesis project by a guy named Nils Denikin. This was uh, a finalist and an awardee at the first Indicate in 2008. While there, and Nils had already sort of taken this name Die Gute Fabrik, which means the good factory, as his company name because he was planning on starting a studio. Um, and then, uh, so I'm gonna show you a couple of games here and then I'm gonna tell you the story. So this is another one, Bernard, and I'm totally blanking on his name, Where's My Heart? Um, this is a essentially an interactive comic book where you play the game by rearranging the squares to create a flow of activity and solve various puzzles. We've seen some games similar to this recently, but, but this was 2008. This was also in the first Indie Hit. And this is Darkroom Sex Game. Now, <laughs> this is a great game because you probably never heard of it, but it's actually super important. Uh, this is a game played with a Wiimote controller and no graphics. Now, let's just stop for a minute. Can you guys think of a game that you play with a game with a console controller that has no graphics, anyone? Yeah, yes. You won't be surprised to learn that the same person designed both these games. So Doug Wilson, who's here on the uh, right, also one of my former students, um, Niels, who's standing next to him, who designed Rick Blenda, uh, Doug, and Lau Kalsgaard, all the way to the left, were uh, part of a group called the Copenhagen Game Collective, which they started. Essentially, they were, they were PhD students at Copenhagen ITU, and they just decided to start this art game collective and make weird games. And one of the things that they were really focusing on was this concept of the digital folk game. So using sort of common childhood playground games as a starting point for thinking about new ways of using technology. With a little bit of a Scandinavian adult twist, they ended up with darkroom sex games. So the basic idea of this game is there's no graphics, and again, I think this is noteworthy because all console <laughs> development forever has been about graphics. That has been the thing that everyone has been fighting about. <laughs> but here was like, yeah, we don't care about that. There's a speaker in this thing, 
and it has an accelerometer in it. So let's do something really interesting. So the game is essentially an orgy, and your goal is to figure out who your partner is. So you're moving the, you're moving the uh, controller around, you're hearing responses to what you're doing, and eventually you're trying to figure out who you're paired with in the group. This actually won an award for a most fun game at IndieCade 1 in 2008. The other thing about it that's important is that Doug Wilson met Niels Denikin. Um, they're both from Denmark, <laughs> but they met in Washington State. <laughs> um, not sure if they would have met any other way. They might have. Actually, I think Niels might actually be from, anyway. They met in, Denmark, in, in Washington. So they went on to make a few more games under the auspices of the Copenhagen Game Collective. This is called Button. Has anyone seen or played this game? Yeah, one person, two people. Yeah, this is a super fun game. So this game is, again, a folk game. I would, I would compare it to like Red Rover or Mother May I. So basically what happens is the controllers are, are used in really weird ways. There's prompts that come up on the screen, so a classic one will be like, the first person whose controller is touched loses, and then everyone runs up and has to push the controllers, and you're trying to push somebody else's controller because you want them to lose. Lots of mayhem ensues. It's a super fun game. This is, uh, so this is actually Doug in the middle, and I think that might be Lau on the right with another IndieCade finalist playing it at IndieCade, I think it was 2009. So, Johann Sebastian Joust, most of you are aware of this game. It is essentially a tag game that uses the move controller with no graphics. Um, this game was shown at IndieCade, I don't remember exactly the year, I'm going to say 2011 or 12, perhaps. Um, again, using the affordances of a controller without worrying about the graphics, groundbreaking. Um, this was pr done in front of the, we have a, we used to, have a firehouse that we used in Culver City that we would show the games. These guys were basically on the street in front of the thing playing. It was fantastic. It's really fun to watch too if you haven't played it or watched it play. And he just basically wrote it on a Mac. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, these guys got together with some other IndieCade finalists and other indie developers, and they made a deal with PlayStation under the, uh, under the umbrella of Deguta Fabrica. <coughs> so the games are Hokra, anyone? Hokra, <laughs> Bari Bari Ball, and Super Pole Riders. And one thing I want to say about these games is they're very exemplary of kind of a classic example of an indie trend. So, and we noticed this right around the time these games started to appear. Hokra was one of the first ones that really caused this trend to catch fire. Yeah. Local multiplayer. Now, this was something that the console companies could do, and sometimes did do, but it wasn't, you know, the main paradigm for digital games has been one person, one screen for decades, starting back with arcade machines for the most part. So. This became a huge trend in indies, and these guys leveraged it by creating this anthology of essentially local multiplayer slash party games for the PlayStation. Um, this has also been really successful, but it was also a really creative way of, of doing a deal. Instead of doing one game, bundling them into something that kind of created a suite of games that were related. This is a affordable space adventures. This is made by Knock which is Lau Cosgard and his partner, D Diana Divmoza, both of whom were in Copenhagen Game Collective. And Copenhagen Game Collective still functions in various configurations, and it's sort of an umbrella where these other studios work with each other. Um, this is a two-player asymmetrical, one of the first Wii U games. So two people using different controllers on the same screen. Um, it's a co-op game, really fun. Um, yeah, so these guys, Diana and Lau, I, th I don't know about Lau, but I know one of them was a PhD student at ITU when they started Copenhagen Game Collective. So this covers a lot of ground, um, pretty much everything except for the, uh, the uh, 
legal end of things, right? Public perception and the legal end of things. So the third, third case study I want to do is Oculus Rift. Um, and this is another one that touches a lot of nodes in the indie ecosystem. Uh, this is Palmer, Kent, Palmer Lucky, who is the founder of Oculus. I actually saw this in a, I was uh, after a swing dancing class going to get some ice cream with my friends and saw this on the newsstand and just about fell over. <laughs> First of all, the fact that he was on the cover of Time was amazing and then bare feet. It's like, <laughs> um, but this story, and again, this story keeps getting told as this kind of lone genius narrative, which is sort of how tech stories are told. People love, oh, this guy who didn't even graduate from college, pulled himself up by his bootstraps and his whiteness, and, um, <laughs> and, and figured out this thing right out of his brain, just without any influence from anyone. This is not correct. Um, does anyone know who this is? You have to be over 40, I'm going to say, to even have any vague idea who this is. This is a guy named Mark Bolas, who you've never heard of. Mark Bolas is one of the original pioneers of VR in the 90s. And he created something called, uh, uh, I forget what the name of it now is, but it's a boom headset. So everybody was like, we're never going to get anywhere if we put a bunch of crap on someone's head. He said, what if we just put it on a... a whatever that's called, or one of those things that move around. There's a name for that. Anyway, um, and then you can just hold it like this. And he went on to work in academia, and you'll never guess who worked for him. <laughs> Mr. Palmer Lucky. So he comes from this rich tradition of multiple generations of VR pioneers, and he had some ideas when he started, it's true, but he wouldn't have really been able to follow through on them without spending some time um, with this guy as a mentor. Now, here comes the crowdfunding part of the equation. And I love showing these. I, I like to pull these up for some of the projects I talk about because I just want you to look for a moment at the numbers. Look at the, the final number and then look at the little tiny number underneath it. So. <laughs> They're like, oh, we'll just get $250,000 and we'll make this thing. <coughs> they got two, almost $2.5 million instead. So this is another example where if this platform didn't exist, there would be no Oculus Rift today, period. There just wouldn't. They might have gotten some funding, but people have always been skeptical of VR. It's, a, it's kind of a money pit. It's never been successful commercially. I, I worked in it in the 90s. It's scary. People don't want to invest in it. But this, what, what crowdfunding enables us to do is outsource the risk so that Facebook can sit around and wait, see what happens, and then put the money in once they think it's a sure bet. And this is one of the things that made it look like a sure bet. As soon as you, as soon as you see this, you go, OK, I think there's some commercial viability here. They haven't even made anything yet, and they've already made $2.5 million. <laughs> So, uh, so they went ahead, they got this money, and they made uh, Oculus Rift uh, Dev Kit 1, DK1. How many people here have a DK1 or have access to one? Okay, so when the DK1 was first introduced, people, literally many people were like, I got this thing in the mail from Oculus, like a headset or something. Did you get one of those? Yes. They sent them to labs, and they sent them to uh, some creators, but mostly academic labs, and to our homes. Like, people were getting them at their house. <laughs> they handpicked all of these academics because they knew we had labs, and they knew we had students. So my experience with that dev kit one was I, I put it in my lab. I went to LA for the summer to work on Indiecade. And while I was gone, my students, uh, Skyped me one day and said, hey, uh, we've been working on this massively multiplayer game in my lab. And they were like, we're bored. Can we put our game on Oculus? <laughs> and I'm like, sure. OK, they're not getting paid. <laughs> they just wanted to do something over the summer. So they taught themselves how to use the Oculus Rift. Does anyone know what this is? This is, this is a game. Oops, where is it? 
This is a game called, uh, it's not a very good picture of the thing, but anyway, this is a game called, uh, I may have a different slide of this. I'll just talk about it now, and I think I have another slide of it. It's called Home Improvisation. Has anyone played this? This was an Oculus Rift launch title. It was actually created by the students who taught themselves to use the Oculus Rift in my lab at the Global Game Jam. <laughs> they put it online and it became huge. Like, it was a runaway hit, a Global Game Jam hit. Um, they, they drove to IndyCade East uh, in, the, in February. I don't know why we would do it in February in New York. It's insane. From Georgia, they got in their car, they drove up to IndyCade East. I introduced them to Sony. Sony was like, Let's, we'll just send you a dev kit. We're not gonna pay you to put this on our platform, but we'll give you a free dev kit, which costs $100,000 if you're buying it. So they made a Steam version, and then they made a PlayStation version. Oh, by the way, on the way back from IndyCade East, they got in a car accident, <laughs> although nobody was hurt. It was snowing, it was really slippery. Um, but anyway, it was worth it anyway, they said. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that story. Um, so IndieCade, one of the things we did early on, Oculus uh, started sponsoring IndieCade almost immediately after they got their money. Um, because they understood something very important, which is a which was kind of a mantra in the 90s that a lot of people have forgotten about. Was anybody here born before the 90s? Okay. Um, so there was a mantra we used to have in the 90s, which was, it's the content, stupid. And uh, I always think that's really important, a really important and forgotten mantra that we should continue to follow because hardware is only as good as the content it delivers. And in the 1990s, there were like, 10 new platforms that were introduced, and very few of them succeeded. And most of them failed because they just, not because they weren't better, because some of them were better. They just didn't have enough content. And why would someone spend $500 on a device that only has three games for it? So Oculus was like, you know what? How about this? Let's make sure there's content on our platform as soon as humanly possible. And that's why they were sending those Oculus Rifts around, and that's why they also sponsored IndieCade. So the, they sponsored the IndieCade Oculus Game Jam, which was a distributed slow jam, by which we meant we gave people like 10 days. We knew they were gonna have to learn the tech, so we gave them a little time to do that. We had some, uh, some video tutorials that the Oculus people gave to all the different sites. My lab at Georgia Tech was one of those sites. And there were not many around the world, I think. And um, Darknet became the winner of that in 2015. And then it went on to become a final, I guess it was 2014, and then it went on to become a finalist. As part of the package for this jam, what we did was we gave people a 30-day um, Unity, free Unity license. And if you finished your game and and showed up with it at IndieCade, you would get a year license. So no matter what, if you participated in this and finished your game, you would get benefited with tools, also through an arrangement we had with Unity. I'm sure most of you have seen or heard of or played this game, yes? Probably the most famous Oculus game, or the first <laughs> Oculus hit, I'm gonna call it. Uh, I remember when we juried this at IndieCade, it was so funny. I mean, I remember playing and going, this is just going to be a slam dunk. Um, because it did a couple things really interesting. It's a multiplayer game, but you only need one headset to play it. Super smart. Also, the game uses the fact that the Oculus cuts off your sensorium from your surroundings as a feature, not a bug. <laughs> it very much has a kind of what you now sort of characterize as a puzzle room type of mechanic. There's a lot of uh, co-op puzzles in, in game rooms, uh, in escape rooms and puzzle rooms where people are in different rooms and one person is seeing something and somebody else is hearing things and they can collaborate. So super fun. If you wanna have a good time, uh, YouTube, a couple years ago, there was a whole series on YouTube of married couples playing this game together. Very funny. 
Anyway, uh, so yeah, this was also done at the Global Game Jam. So you see how complex these interdependencies are getting. Um, then, of course, Facebook bought the Oculus. And this brings up kind of an interesting thing that I see happening a lot, which is things don't stay indie necessarily. So, for instance, um, Minecraft. One guy made Minecraft, and now it's owned by Microsoft. And he made like a billion dollars or something. Um, there is this porousness between indie and mainstream that also didn't used to exist. This would never have happened in 2000, ever. So, um, and, and you know, you can see it, it's common in other media. It's common in film, indie films that become huge blockbuster hits is a good example of this. But it was a fairly new phenomenon in games. Oh, and here's home improvisation. So this is the game I mentioned. Um, I want to say a couple of other things about this. I told you guys the story of how it was made. What you're seeing here is an example of something called Franken furniture. So home improvisation, as you can probably tell from this logo, is a, an IKEA spoof. And the idea of the game is that you get furniture kits, but they have no instructions. So you have to figure out how to put the furniture together. But one of the things they did that was really clever, and, and this was actually, they told me, actually based on a game they did, they worked on in my lab, a, a mini game within our online game. Um, they made all the parts interchangeable. So this is an example of Franken furniture, and if you go online and you look up home improvisation Franken furniture, again, lots of videos, people just started making these weird sculptures out of interchangeable furniture parts. Um, later on, they added a drill as a like reward. If you play the game enough, you can get a little drill, and then you can even make more weird things. Um, but it was amazing how quickly this, this took off. Even before it was on the PlayStation, people were making these weird Franken furniture things. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is I want to say something about the so-called indie apocalypse. The indie apocalypse, I believe, is a hype myth. Um, and, and I have a very I have some very specific data-backed reasons for thinking this. When Home Improvisation was released on PlayStation, it was one of a number of VR launch titles. Every single one of those VR launch titles was an indie game. Most of them had been an indie game. Some of them years before. That was also the year that Sony announced that they would stop supporting indie studios. Everybody is freaking out. I never take anything at face value. I was like, okay, why are you showing all of these indie VR games and claiming you're not supporting indies? So even though their PR was saying one thing, their, their actions were saying something radically different. So this is an example of why I don't believe the hype, because really the data tells a different story. Um, so that's the new Oculus headset. And this is the thing that I think is really interesting about this. Um, and back to just to say this, part of the reason this, was, this became a thing was because they did it on Oculus first. OK, that's the commercial headset. So by the time this thing came out, there were literally hundreds of titles for it on Steam. This piece of hardware literally came out. And the next day, you could go on and download 100 games for it. Genius, in my opinion. This is like definitely putting the horse before the cart in a really smart way. Um, before that, those games were played by other developers. So that was really interesting, too. Like, not only could you make a VR game, you could publish it, and other people with that DK1 dev kit could play it. So there also became this whole community of people that were already developing for this platform. And where, the, where were they showing their works? At festivals, at BFIG, at Indiecade, etc. So this case study pretty much covers everything. <laughs> um, so my final question for you is, what percentage of game developers are indie? 50%. Correct. 50%. Most people would just argue with you about this. And people that I know and also people that teach in our program are arguing with me about this. But there have been multiple surveys over multiple years. And this is pretty much staying at a steady 50%. So in 2014, 
Actually, while I was interviewing for this job, I went to GDC, and this report that I worked on was released in 2014. I kind of kick-started this because they wanted to do another diversity survey. There's some interesting information on here, but the thing I want you to pay attention to is this. Independent, 48%. Okay. Even more interesting, look at this. I'd rather work for an independent studio. Now, one of the interesting things we did with the survey that we had never done before is we included students in it. <coughs> IGDA sur surveys never included students, and they never included college professors. Um, but we added affordances for that. And one of the things we found out was that, first of all, the gender divide was, was better. So it's 22, it was 22% among working developers, but it was 30% among students. So to me, that's, I'm always looking at the future. I'm like, these are the people that are going to be the next generation. And so that number's going up, slowly but surely. Um, so when we started the program at Northeastern in fall of, two, uh, I started working on it in fall of 2014, I came, in, I came to the table and I said, listen, I just did this survey. Half of our students are going to be in indie studios. For the last decade, we've all been training our students to work at Sony and EA. And that's great. But only half of them are ever going to work at those studios. So we need to figure out how to broaden our, our purview so that they have viable careers in half of the industry. Um, so I, this is what the program that I designed at, at um, Northeastern with uh, Susan Gold, who is the co-founder of Global Game Jam, was designed to address this changing environment. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because I'm running short on time, but I do want to say a couple things to plug our program and then leave time for questions. So what we did with our program is we hired both full-time and part-time faculty who are very well-established experts in indie games. Obviously, our fearless leader at Boston Fig, Carolyn Murphy, who is featured here and just won a a rising Pixel Award, super excited about that. Um, Caroline is teaching our graduate game business class. That was a very deliberate choice on our part. Like, we want them to understand that there's other business models that they can work with. Um, one of the founders of Deguta Fabric is currently on our faculty. Two of the Global Game Jam uh, staff have worked at our, at our, in our program. Uh, one of the developers of Pop Tropica is currently teaching our level design class. And um, obviously, Boston Indie Game, uh, Boston Fig is represented. Um, on the lower right, you'll see uh, Callian Pletcher Adams, who's sitting in the back row right there, with Lizzie Stark, who's running a LARP later today, both of whom have been teaching for us as well. And um, I just decided to plug myself and show my 2016. Boston Fig Award, because I'm so proud of it. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, the middle one is uh, uh, a team that does uh, activist games and tactical media. So they've been in Games for Change and, and Indicate and other festivals, and they're also full-time faculty at Northeastern now. And then there are our students. And our students have been making an increasingly large footprint. How many Northeastern students are here right now? OK, a few. Ryan, obviously, is a Northeastern student. He's been in a couple of my classes, I think, at this point. Um, so they've, and that's Ryan in the picture with longer hair. That's, that's Ryan with his undergraduate haircut. Now he has his I'm looking for a job haircut. Um, <laughs> but um, they were at Mass Digi showing their game. Uh, we've had stuff in Boston Fig now uh, for the last, it's funny, we didn't in the beginning, but now we're starting to be regulars at Boston Fig, which I was like, yes. Um, this game, Dominature, was the showcase winner last year, um, and I think it was also in Boston Fig this year, right? And then uh, that's Brandon Sischling, who's now heading up the BFA with some of our students in the Student Center game room, which I didn't really know anything about until I found this picture. Um, I also wanted to just do a shameless plug for the project that I'm working on now, because people in this room are involved as well. Um, I have been working on the problem of audience agency and immersive theater. So I was looking at, uh, I was playing a lot of LARPs. I was going to immersive theater. Um, I started meeting people in Boston who were doing 
who were game designers who were doing immersive theater things that were very um, much more interesting in terms of audience interaction than most of the stuff I had seen coming out of the immersive theater scene. So I started this sort of consortium of people that are interested in working on these problems. Our first workshop is gonna be on Wednesday the 27th, right across the street from Northeastern. If you wanna know more about it, I can talk to you about it afterwards. Um, but we're gonna have a series of three workshops uh, about different aspects of getting audiences more engaged in live performance. That's me. Somehow my text got wonky. But um, yeah, questions? Is that good, time-wise? Yeah. I love that there's a giant clock up there. That really helps. Questions? No? What? I'll send them to you. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, actually, if people, if you do want to see the slides, that's great. I ask that you not publish them. Somebody has been publishing my talks on some PowerPoint publishing thing, and it pisses me off because I didn't give them permission. So you're welcome to look at it. You're welcome to share it with friends, but please don't like post it somewhere. Uh, yes. So half the students end up in indie companies. Where do the other half end up? The other half are going to end up at mainstream studios. So Electronic Arts, Sony, Ubisoft, those kinds of places, which is when I started developing these programs in the late 90s, where almost all of them were going to end up working. Um, I also actually want to follow up with that, because I think we also have a kind of perhaps very narrow construal of what an indie studio is. So a great example actually is Kellyanne's studio, Green Door Labs. Uh, she makes a, a, a pretty substantial percentage of her revenue by doing work for museums. So. She's not selling her games on the App Store, or maybe she is or will be, but her income is coming out of clients, basically. Um, at Northeastern, we have several faculty members that get grants, and they're also making serious games, games for change kinds of games. And both of those entities are hiring our students. So, so several of our students have co-opted with Kellyanne's Lab, which is one of the reasons I wanted indie developers to be teaching for us, because that way, the students can develop the networking. Most of the indie hiring world, like our co-op pro program is great, but it's completely befuddled by this indie thing because they just want to go to a website at a big corporation and see the internship page. And most indies don't even know they need an intern. So I'm going to make a plug for this right now. Um, if you have some work that needs to be done that you don't have time to do and you have a little money lying around and you don't want to pay somebody a salary or insurance, hey, we have students, they do really good work. You still have to pay them, but you don't have to worry about committing to them on a long-term basis. Yes? I, I actually was hired by an indie studio uh, in the summer as an intern. Great. So I'm, and now I'm permanent. So there we go. It worked out. Yay, success. Yes? Uh, how many uh, of the 50% of uh, students who go to indie studios end up creating their own studio or, or move on? How many of the, uh, you know what? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, there are one, I've actually been trying to get some funding to answer some much more like, there are a bunch of questions that I have that I can't answer without some resources. One of them is, how many Global Game Jam games have been in IndieCade? I actually called the founder of Global Game Jams and said, hey, how many of your games have been in IndieCade? And she said, I have no idea. We have no idea. I and mean, somebody has to do some like, preferably computerized data scrubbing to figure this out, right? Especially because some of the games will change names when they get published. So that's an example. There's a lot of information like that. We don't, I don't know, I mean, I'd love to do just, I probably will at some point, just an indie, just straight indie survey. I'd like to know how many people are in collectives. I'd like to know how many people do contract work. So here's another interesting story. Um, I have two, two sets of students who started um, indie, labs, they got on the VR bandwagon as contractors, and so they do their own games and publish them, but they also do contracts for like industrial training and things of this nature, or marketing. Um, so those are other models. There are also grants, so some 
uh, creators can work through the art grant system depending on what their audience is. Um, that's much more common in Europe and believe it or not Australia than it is here in the US because of course we hate art so we don't fund it. But, um, <laughs> and if we do, we don't give it enough money to make a game. But, uh, but there are lots of other kinds of funding models. Also a uh, academic grant contracts. Um, I I've had some of my former students from Georgia Tech, in fact, one, the guys that did the home improvisation game actually went on a Northeastern grant when I got here as contractors. Also, several of our adjunct faculty have worked on our grant projects as well. So right now I'm actually working on um, a proposal. I just finished a proposal to run uh, Sam Liberty and Miranda Banks have made a game about diversity and team formation. Um, so I'm, I wrote a proposal to run it like officially as part of Northeastern's orientation. So there's a lot of this going on where there's a, a flow back and forth amongst these different participants in the ecosystem. Maybe one or two more depending on how long. Hi. Well, I think I, I would start by saying 20 years ago there was no such thing as game academia. I mean, I went to uh, USC in 1998, so basically 21 years ago. Um, and that program launched in 2000, I'm going to say one or two. So it's not even a decade old. It's the top program in the country. So. Um, it's a fairly new thing. Um, I'll tell you what I've noticed that's, that's interesting. Um, more and more people in academia are making games. Those games are getting published, so that's interesting. Um, the other thing is that when we first started, we were kind of shunned. So the first instantiation of the USC program, our lab was in a leaky basement underneath the television building. I feel that that is a very spatial representation of our status in the film school. We were below the lowest form of media at that point. Um, now they have their own building. Um, people didn't want to use what I called the G word when we would write these programs. Nobody wanted to put the word game. It's interactive media. I think people in the film school there thought it was going to be interactive cinema. That did really well. Um, so, so, um, so I think it's become more, uh, it, it went from being marginalized to socially acceptable and now people are fighting over it. Like in some places, different departments are actually fighting each other for who owns games. So it's become a thing that people want and that people fight over the, the status for. That's probably the biggest change as far as academia goes. One more. Do you think that the maturation of gamers is allowing a more diverse type of game to be well received by audiences? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, we have time for one more now. <laughs> um, so do you think that there is a better uh, option for college graduates, uh, like what type of studio to enter? So at Becker, we're told uh, to fail on um, other people's dimes after we graduate, and we're learning to learn. Um, so, you know, when we go search for a job, we're ideally trying to find some place that we can learn uh, and get paid for it. And uh, I feel like one of the issues with indie studios is they can't necessarily afford that. Are you talking about a co-op or a full-time job? Full-time job. Okay. Um, I think the way to do it is exactly what uh, this guy here was talking about, which is you go, if you go into an indie studio as an intern, you're not asking them to make a commitment to you. You're just essentially auditioning for a part. Um, I, tell, I tell my students, like, if you want to go intern, one of the things I tell them all the time, if you want to go, this is my trade secrets, don't play this on the video. If you want to work at an indie studio, go on Kickstarter and see what just got funded and how much they got. And you can just go there and say, hey, you can hire me for three months to help you do that artwork on your game, right? Um, if, if you prove yourself valuable and the projects are successful, they'll keep you on. <laughs> and I've, this is not an unusual story. I've heard actually this a lot. The other thing that, I, that interests me and kind of troubles me a little bit is that a lot of our students seem to be really 
focused on digital games. So one of my students yesterday was talking to me about cops, and she said, well, I worked at a board game studio over the summer. New England is literally the birthplace of the board game, like 150 years ago. There are so many board game studios here. There's indie studios, there's Hasbro. It's huge. It's a great way to learn about game design, even if you don't want to do that ultimately. Um, but so just thinking a little bit outside of the box, I think, is another way to do it. But here's the one thing I will tell you. Students, I'll never say this enough times. The best way to get a job is to make a game that's popular. And the best way to do that is to submit to festivals. Come to submit your game to Boston Fig. If you do that, you will not have to apply for a job. <laughs> Either you will be able to fund your project or people will come to you and want you to work for them. The most important thing an employer wants to know, I was, I was giving my students a, a little scolding last week because they were I had them do a show and tell of their own work. And everybody started with a, a, some kind of self-effacing caveat. Well, I can't code, and I can't do this. And I, I said, nobody cares what you can't do. We just want to know what you can do. So show me what you can do. So a portfolio is really key. I'm not going to take your word for it that you're a good game designer unless you can prove it to me. So I would just say, make games, get them out there, submit them to festivals, put them on HIO. Throughout your college career, that's the time when you can risk, right? When you can be creative, think outside of the box, go crazy, and then at the end, you have a portfolio to show that you can do it. And, and anybody you go to, whether it's an indie studio or a big studio, that's what they want to see. And maybe they'll tamp your creativity down if you go work at a big studio. But at least you've proven that you can do what they need. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.